you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. We are coming right to the end of this letter. Listen as I read, beginning at verse 15. Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. That you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. Paul is commending the household of Stephanus for their devotion to the ministry, for their labor, for all the things that they were doing. It's good to have a devotion to God's work, and they certainly did. Verse 17, I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. For they have refreshed my spirit in yours, therefore acknowledge such men. Paul was in the city of Ephesus and when he wrote this letter. And he writes to them now, to the Corinthians, and he, and he says how refreshed he was when Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus had come to minister to him. Those guys really have some solid names, don't they? Um, Paul writes and says what a blessing it was for Paul. For Paul to, re, to receive these men, to, to, to hear from them. They came from, from the city of Corinth, from the church of Corinth. And they, they told him how the church was going. They ministered to him. They blessed him. And he wants to acknowledge these men. They were a blessing to him. Look at verse 19. It says, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that's in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And so Paul now when that, this letter is nearly, nearly closed, he sends his greetings from all the churches in Asia, greetings from Aquila and Prisca, greetings from all the brethren. There is just a love among all these churches, and he, and he sends the love uh, to the Corinthians from all these churches. And there's, there's just this beautiful love between the churches, and there's a love, love among Christians today. We're still in, we're, we're in God's family, and there's, there's this wonderful love in the churches and so Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And we do something similar here. We greet one another with a, with a handshake. And it's, it's really good to show that love and that affection to our brothers and sisters by just even grabbing their hands and saying, uh, greetings, brother. Greetings, sister. Amen. And so we, we need to do that. And so uh, then verse 21, Paul says, the greeting is in my own hand. Paul. Well, Paul lets the Corinthians know this letter is authentic. He wrote it. He lets them know he's the author by signing his name in his own writing. What Paul did and what many of the writers in the New Testament did is they would have uh, a person write the letter and they would dictate. But then at the end, after Paul would dictate and this person would write this letter out, then Paul at the very end, he would he'd put his signature on it. And that was the way to... Uh, let those who read it know this is an authentic letter. This is truly from Paul. And so Paul says, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Now, something happens right here in this letter. He's closing this letter down. He's thanking them for ministering to him. He's, he's greeting them. He's telling each other, he's telling them, greet each other with a holy kiss. He's, he's just winding this letter down. And then, it's like all of a sudden, uh, something happens right here when Paul's ending this letter. He suddenly, it just sure seems sudden, it just seems abrupt. All of a sudden, at the end of this letter, right when you're expecting it just to close down, Paul brings in something just so strong at the end. It's really kind of unexpected. And yet it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so we know this is exactly how it was supposed to happen. And yet, just reading a letter like this, you would not expect a sentence like this to happen right now at the end after he's just closing things down and telling everyone to greet each other and giving thanksgiving and all this. All of a sudden, he comes up with this verse, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. Maranatha. Those are strong words. They're not something you'd expect at the end of a letter. If anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. Maranatha. It really raises some questions. Let's raise some questions. Uh, the first question, what, 
Who is Paul referring to when he says, if anybody does not love the Lord? The second question, what does Paul mean when he says he is to be accursed? And a third question, why does he say Maranatha? Well, let's look at that first question. Who is Paul referring to when he says, if anybody does not love the Lord? There are people who reject the Lord. They, they don't want him. They don't seek him. They don't wish to come under his lordship. They don't want to follow him. They don't want to obey him. They do not love the Lord. Paul is referring to all these people. He is referring to anybody who does not love the Lord. If anybody does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Now, to not love the Lord, that is the natural state of the unbeliever. The natural man. The, the man without Christ. He does not love the Lord. In fact, the Bible says that the natural man, the one without Christ, that he is hostile to God. Now, a person might say, well, well I know people who are Christians... Oh, I'm sorry. I know people who are not Christians, but, but they don't seem to be hostile to God. Outward, outwardly, they might not look hostile to God, but the Bible says they are. In Romans 8, 7, it says the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And so the mindset on the flesh, that is the, the person who is in his natural state, the person who's not a believer, the Bible says they are hostile to God. You, you might not see acts of hostility towards God, but inside where you can't see, there is a hostility inside. They don't love the Lord. Let me describe a few types of people who do not love the Lord. There's the regular everyday guy. Regular everyday guy. He's a decent enough guy, a guy you might know at work, or a neighbor. He has a job. He has a family, a wife and kids. He's responsible. He pays his bills. He works. He has fun. He seems to be just an ordinary, regular guy. Now, he doesn't go to church. He doesn't pray. He doesn't read the Bible. He doesn't think about the things of the Lord. He, he, he just lives his life without the Lord. He's not thinking about it. He doesn't look like he has any hostility towards the Lord. But the Bible says he does. Romans 8, 7. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. This man is just living his life. He, he doesn't think about the things of God. He, it might not look like, well, it, it might look like he's neutral towards God. Like he's neutral. Not for God, not against God. But the truth is, there's no neutral ground with the Lord. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Th this guy seems like an ordinary guy, but in his heart, he truly does reject the Lord. He does not love the Lord. And so Christian, the regular, everyday, ordinary man or woman who doesn't know the Lord, who's just going along through life, that person does not love the Lord. And that's a serious thing because 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. And so one type of person who does not love the Lord, the average, regular, ordinary guy just going through life who's not a Christian. Let's look at another type of person who does not love the Lord. There are those who reject the Lord and they do it openly. They proclaim it. This is not the regular, ordinary guy just going through life, not thinking about the Lord. This person openly rejects the Lord. He, he makes it known. He's hostile towards God and he's not hiding it. In the Bible, there are several people that stand out who openly hated God and rejected his ways. For instance, Every single king in the ten tribes of northern Israel, every single one of them hated God. In the southern tribes, there were some godly kings and there were several that weren't. But in the northern tribes, they all hated God. For instance, I'll just take one of them, King Ahaz. In 2 Corinthians 16.3, this is what it says about King Ahaz. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel and even made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out from before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. King Ahaz turned away from God and he worshiped idols. He sacrificed his own son in fire to their false gods. And he, and he caused all of Israel to set up idols and burn incense to them. As the Bible says, under every green tree, on every high hill, there was idols. Ahaz set them up. 
Ahaz did not love the Lord. Instead, he rejected the Lord openly, and he practiced idolatry openly. In the New Testament, we see an open hostility towards Jesus Christ. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they hated the Lord. They determined in their hearts that they would even kill him. In John eleven fifty three, 53, it says, so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. And so there was, and there still are people who, they're not just regular guys just going through life. There are people also who openly reject Christ and they make it known. They don't hide it. They proclaim it. They do not love the Lord and they let you know it. For instance, there are college professors, and I'm not putting all college professors in a box. I know there's college professors who love the Lord, but there's college professors on campuses who proclaim their atheisms, who hate the Lord, and they try to destroy any faith that their students who are Christians might have. I know this is true because I've talked to students in these campuses under these professors. They do not love the Lord, and they're not ashamed to hide it. They'll say it. They'll proclaim it. There's a movement. There's a movement in this country in some areas to teach sexual perversion and immorality to young kids in elementary schools and public libraries. There's a whole movement. You, you know all about it. I don't have to describe it. It's, it's, it's in the news. The people behind this movement who would teach our young kids perversion and immorality, they don't love the Lord. There's no way they love the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16.22 says, If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Today we see, and I don't know how else to put it, we see a massive slaughter of babies right here in the United States. Babies made in God's image, being torn right out of their mother's wombs, and it's legal. It's not legal in God's eyes, it never has been, never will be, but it's legal in man's eyes. The abortionist does not fear God. He openly does not love God. He despises God, and he makes it very clear by his wicked actions. The wicked practice of murdering babies in the womb. It's an abomination to the Lord and the people who promote it and the people who participate in it and the people who walk around with signs and show openly. They show openly that they don't love the Lord. There's forgiveness or salvation for those who repent, but for those who do not, they do not love the Lord. And the Bible says if anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. So the practice of abortion, the whole movement, of making it legal. Just one example that reveals people who do not fear God, who openly do not love the Lord. There are people, several types of people, who openly proclaim they are against the Lord. They stand against the Lord and against his people, against his church. They openly proclaim they stand against Jesus Christ. They do not love the Lord. And this is a fearful thing. Because the Bible says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Let me give you one more type of person who does not love the Lord. There's, a, there's, a, there's the person who professes to be a Christian, but they are a Christian in name only. They, they might go to church. They might say, I am a Christian if asked. But they're actually a Christianized pagan. They know the words. They know the walk. They know the talk. But inside... The Lord does not live in their heart. A person like this might have people fooled that he's a Christian. He might even be fooling himself, but his life betrays him. He's not concerned about living to please the Lord. He's not seeing the Lord as his treasure. He's not concerned about knowing or obeying God's commands. He's a Christian in name only. Even if he goes to church, there's been no interchange of the heart. There's no spiritual life in him. As the Bible says in Matthew 23, 27, the Christian in name only is like a whitewashed tomb, which appears beautiful on the outside, but on the inside it's full of dead men's bones. The Christian in name only is in a serious place because he doesn't know the Lord and he doesn't love the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. And so we see there's many types of people who do not love the Lord. They're, they're just regular guys. Regular girls. Others are very vocal about it. They proclaim it. And some are pretend Christians. But whatever type of person it is who does not love the Lord, the end result is the same. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Think about how strong that statement is. 
If anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. And so we raise the question, who is Paul referring to when he says, if anybody does not love the Lord? He's referring literally to anybody who does not love the Lord. Well, let's look at the next question. What does Paul mean when he says he is to be accursed? The person who does not love the Lord, who instead rejects the Lord, if he doesn't repent, if he doesn't receive the Lord and trust in him for salvation, he will one day be accursed. That's the only possible outcome. To get an idea of what it is to be accursed, we can see it on a physical level in the book of Joshua. Now, I got to tell you, talking about this is not a pleasant thing to do. It's something that as a pastor, I would, I, I don't get pleasure in talking about this. Um, but I'm going to talk about it because it's in the Bible. And I know you guys want me to preach what's in the word. And so we're not skipping this. But this is not an easy thing to talk about. It's so serious. It's so serious. I, 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 I can't imagine someone hearing about this and not getting at least in somewhat of a somber mood. But I want to show you what the Bible means. It is to be accursed. We can see an example of it on a physical level, just on a physical level, in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. If you want to turn there, turn there. Or just listen as I read. The city of Jericho, this was when Israel first went into the land of Canaan, and, and, and God was driving out the Canaanites. And he was driving them out because of their wickedness. The city of Jericho was a city of the Canaanites. And it was accursed by God. And so when we see what happened to Jericho, we get an idea what that word means to be accursed. It was under what was called the ban, B-A-N, the ban in the Bible. That's what it was called, the ban. And if a city was placed under the ban, it meant that every person, every man, every woman, every child, even every animal was to be killed. And then after that, the city itself was to be burned with fire, and completely destroyed. Only the silver and the gold were to be taken for the Lord's treasury. Otherwise, the city was to be turned into a heap of rubble and ashes. Listen to this account. Joshua 6.1. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. And so Israel had come to the city of Jericho and they surrounded it. They surrounded it. Verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands with his king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And so here's Israel, the, 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 the nation of Israel, and they, they got this city surrounded, and the priests were leading the way. They carried the ark. They had trumpets. And once each day, they would walk around the city. For six days, they'd walk around the city. That's an interesting thing to me. And then on the seventh day, they walked around the city seven times. And then they blew the trumpets. Verse 5 says, It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. The, Israel's mar the Israelites marched around that city once each day, and on the seventh day they marched around it seven times. And, I, and this is sheer conjecture. I don't typically conjecture about anything in Scripture. I, I, I want to know what does this mean? What was the author, the Holy Spirit, trying to say to the reader? And this is a part that's not told, but I, I can't help but wondering, from looking at the mercy of God, from looking at all the different passages on the mercy of God, and I think Jericho was about to be utterly destroyed. God didn't just go in there and wipe them out. He had the Israelites march around that city for six days, once a day, and then on the seventh day, seven times. And I, 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 again, I don't know, but I can't help but wondering. That number seven, that's the number of completion. 
God created the world and rested on the seventh day. Seven is the number of completion. And it was seven days where God had the Israelites march around that city. And I can't help but wondering, they knew they were going to be destroyed. I can't help but wondering if God was giving them the chance to repent. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. So I'm not saying he was. I don't know. But it makes me wonder because they marched around. They marched around. They marched around. And they did that. And then on the seventh day, like this is your last chance, they marched around seven times. Whatever, whatever it was, the people didn't repent. Verse 20 says, So the people shouted, and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey. With the edge of the sword, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and, and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. God had mercy on Rahab because initially Israel spied out the city. And Rahab protected the spies when it was found that they were in the city. She protected the spies. She hid them and let them escape over the wall. And so when God put the ban on the city, he had mercy on Rahab and her family. Verse 24, it says, They burned the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Every man, every woman, every child, every animal in Jericho was killed with the edge of the sword, except Rahab and her family. And then... And then the city and everything in it was burned with fire. And all that was left when they were done was a heap of rubble and ashes. The city was utterly annihilated. The city of Jericho and everyone in it was accursed. So what does our verse mean when it says, If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. It means that there is an ultimate Jericho coming. It means that there is a far worse than Jericho coming. It means that at the end of life, when a person leaves this world, if they do not love the Lord, if they've instead rejected him, they will face a judgment far worse, far worse than the total fiery annihilation of Jericho. They'll be accursed. They'll be condemned to the fires of hell. It's like a person right now who is alive and they are at this point in their life not loving the Lord. It's at this point in their life they're rejecting the Lord. It's like even right now they're in the city of Jericho and, 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 and the march around the city. I mean, just an, an analogy. There's a march around the city. And, and this is the chance to repent When an unbeliever dies, when they've breathed their last breath, when their heart is beat for its last time, and there's nothing left anymore, the body stops. At that moment, the, the body and the soul, they're separated, and that's what we call death. Their spirit leaves the body, and it goes to hell immediately. But on the last day, when Jesus Christ returns... The Bible says that the dead will be raised. And we know that. We know that the trumpet will sound, the, the shout of the archangel, and, and, and God's people, their bodies will be risen, and they'll be glorified, they'll be with Jesus. But we don't always think about it, but it won't be just God's people whose bodies are raised. The Bible says all bodies will be raised, and all bodies will be joined to their spirits. And those who do not love the Lord, their body... And their spirit will be joined. And the Bible says both body and soul will be cast into the lake of fire. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Body, this very body, is going to rise, Christian. And those who don't believe, body and soul will be in hell. 
How can you possibly describe hell and do it justice? It's hard enough to describe what happened to Jericho and do it justice. But how can you describe hell? There is no place like it on, on the earth. Jericho was accursed. Every man, every woman, every child, even every animal was slaughtered with the sword. God completely and utterly wiped that city out and, and then burned it to a heap of ashes and rubble. There was nothing left of it. If that's what it is to be accursed just on a physical level, what must it be like to be accursed in eternity? Hell is far beyond what happened to Jericho. Understand this. Hell was created by God for the devil and his angels. You think about that. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. We know from the Bible, hell will be a place of burning fire and darkness. It will be a place of fear and torment and suffering, and it won't come to an end, ever. Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. The, uh, the, the thought of hell is so terrifying. It, it is so terrifying, it should elicit the fear, the fear of God. And, and it, it, if a person can imagine even for a moment what it's like, it will elicit the fear of God. And if it does, that's a good thing. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord can drive a person to Christ for mercy and forgiveness. But for those who do not fear the Lord, for those who do not love the Lord, Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hell is real. Hell is real. I've done a lot of funerals over the years. And the, the, one, of the, one thing that I really, I really don't like to do, I do it, but I don't like to do it. I don't like to do the funeral of someone who's an unbeliever. It's almost like, what do you say? You, you, you can't rightly say they're better off because they're definitely not. What I, I give the gospel at those funerals. That's what I do. I just kind of, I give the gospel. Amen. But you, you, you think about, at the end of a funeral, what we do, and, and you know all this, you've all been to a funeral, you, you go to the cemetery. You go to the cemetery, and there's a, there's a short graveside service just commending the body to the Lord, commending the body to the ground and the spirit to the Lord. And, and, you, and you look around, and, and you see all these graves. And it makes you realize, you know, we're alive right now. When we're alive, you, 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 there's this, there's, especially with young people, but there's this, there's this thing where you almost think, you, you know, that's, that's so far away. There's something unreal about it. It's like it's just not even going to happen, but you know it is. And then you see the reality of it when someone you know dies. You see the reality of it when you see one of your relatives die. And you see the reality of it when you walk through the graveyard and you see actual names and dates. That time, that year, that person was born, and, and that year they died, and there was a life there. There was a whole life. And now that, that soul left that body, and where is it? Wherever it is, it's there forever. Wherever it is, it's eternal. And we have this time right now, this short time called life, 70, 80 years by strength. And then our body can no longer sustain holding on to our soul. Our body dies. And our soul goes on. And it's eternal. Wherever it goes. Hell is real. And for those who enter there, it's final. And there's no hope for them. There's no escape. There's no relief. When the sun burns out, hell will still be going. 
There is nothing more fearful, nothing more terrifying than one day thinking, waking up in hell. Isaiah, the prophet, mentions some sinners who realized their danger of hell. And it says this, Isaiah 33, 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? We raise the question, what does Paul mean when he says he is to be accursed? Paul's referring to the curse of hell itself for those who reject Christ, for those who do not love the Lord. Let's look at one more question. Why does Paul say Maranatha? If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. The word Maranatha means, come Lord Jesus. This verse could say, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Come Lord Jesus. Paul is teaching us here. He's stating his deep desire for the Lord to return. Come Lord Jesus. He sees the persecution of the church. He sees the enemies of Christ who hate the Lord he, and hate the church. He, he sees, sees the trials and the tribulations that the Lord's people are, are going through. And so he says, come Lord Jesus. Christian, we're living in a world with two kingdoms in it. There's the kingdom of God, Christ's kingdom, the church. It consists of those who are born again. It consists of those who love the Lord. And it's, a, it's, it's great to be in the kingdom of God, Amen. And there's another kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, where the devil reigns. And those in that kingdom reject Christ, and they do not love the Lord. They are, right now, until they repent, accursed. There's going to be a great judgment at the end of the age, when the Lord returns. This age is winding down. There is some urgency to this. Revelation 20, 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds." Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Those whose names are written in the book of life, they are those who love the Lord. They are those whom God has saved. They are those who love Jesus and have trusted in him as their Lord and Savior. They are saved. Their sins are forgiven. Their name is etched in the book of life. They've been washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. But those whose names are not written in the book of life, the Bible says they were thrown into the lake of fire. They are those who did not receive the Lord's free offer of mercy and forgiveness and salvation. They are those who trampled underfoot the blood of Christ as if it was a worthless thing. They spurned the Holy Spirit who gives life. The ones who are cast into the lake of fire, they are those who did not love the Lord. There are two kingdoms, Christian. The kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of the devil. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of heaven and the prison of hell. Which one do you belong to? Paul said, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. He wanted the Lord to return and he wanted to see the judgment come and he wanted to see the salvation of the church come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming. The judgment is coming. For Christian salvation is coming. Which kingdom are you in? If you don't know Jesus, if you don't love Jesus, you are spiritually in the city of Jericho and spiritually Israel is on the march. And that trumpet's gonna blow and the walls are gonna come down. Which kingdom are you in?
Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just pray today that uh, we just receive your message, your word into our hearts. I pray today, Lord, if there's someone sitting here in this church right now or someone listening online and they don't know, they don't know which kingdom they belong to. Lord, may they, may they have the fear of the Lord. Lord, may they bow down to you and surrender to you. May they just fold their hands and close their eyes and say, come, Lord Jesus, into my heart, into my life and save me. Have mercy on me. And Father, you will. And we thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.